Today on the IoT Show, we're going to talk about the Azure Sphere OS, which is that operating system that powers Azure Sphere and secures MCUs. And we have Barry Bond and Ryan Fairfax from the Azure Sphere. That's today on the IoT Show. Hi everyone, you're watching the IoT Show. I'm Olivier, your host. We've been talking about Azure Sphere on the show here a couple times already. Uh, today, we're going to give a closer look at the Azure Sphere OS. And we have Barry Bond and Ryan Fairfax from the Azure Sphere team with us. And Barry is the first on. Barry, thanks for joining the show today. Thank you. So Barry, tell us a bit about yourself before we're going to talk about the Azure Sphere OS. Well, who are you? What are you doing at Microsoft? Sure, I'm a principal software engineer. And my focus on Azure Sphere is on air, on failure reporting, which is collecting device behavior data and analyzing. It. Awesome. So we talked about Azure Sphere uh, with the principle of, of securing IoT devices. Uh, and um, what we want to do today is talk a bit more about the Azure Sphere OS, which is one of the three components of Azure Sphere, the hardware, the OS, and the security service. So let's take a look at this Azure Sphere OS. What is it about? And, and Introduce the topic, and then we're going to go back and forth with, with Ryan to dive into the topic itself. So the Azure Sphere OS is built to offer unequaled security and agility. It's a five-layer defense and depth OS, which includes a custom Linux kernel. Having multiple layers of security means that in the case of devices compromised, the reach of the compromise is limited, making it harder for an attacker to take control of the whole device. The OS is managed by Microsoft for more than 10 years. We build, service, and deploy OS updates directly to devices. We take on the rigorous work of maintaining a secure operating system so that manufacturers can focus on their applications and their features. Awesome. So yeah, definitely we discussed that with my call on the show previously to talk about the developer experience on how you build the apps for Azure Sphere and embrace that security of a set of security principles and features that uh, the Sphere OS proposes. But so let's let's dive into the architecture. Let's bring in Ryan for that. Hey Ryan, thanks for joining the show today. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? What are you doing at Microsoft? Yeah, thanks for uh, having me on, Olivier. So my name is Ryan Fairfax. I'm an engineering manager on the Azure Sphere team, where I've been working on this project for the last four years. And I lead the team that is responsible for enabling new system on a chip platforms and new hardware um, for the Azure Sphere OS to run on. And so it's really about adding support for the diversity of hardware that is IoT. Awesome. Yes, is that glue we're going to talk a bit about, you know, the glue between the the OS itself and what's specific to the hardware uh, with our different uh, hardware manufacturer partners. So uh, can you walk us through the architecture of the, uh, of the Azure Sphere OS? That's going to actually explain a bit more about these various layers and where that integration happens. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've, we've got a kind of slide that shows the main components in the OS. But the first thing I really want to highlight here is the Azure Sphere OS is what I would call a hybrid operating system. There are many components working in tandem on different CPU cores to provide the complete set of services. And this is in contrast to um, something like traditional Linux on a desktop, where you have applications, you have a kernel, and it's often contained to one, one uh, CPU in your machine. So if you look at this diagram here, kind of the foundation of the Azure Sphere OS is actually hardware. We designed the operating system with a set of hardware constraints in mind to be able to drive strong security into the platform and to enable new types of resource isolation that you can't do without the hardware being involved. Um, the next component in our system is what we call the Pluton runtime, which is kind of the core of trust in our system. And it drives security sensitive operations like secure boot, like crypto acceleration key management. Uh, above that, we have the security monitor, which protects security sensitive operations like writing to flash, driving over the air updates, things that if they went wrong would have a strong impact to the system. Uh, next, we have a customized Linux kernel. And so we've really uh, leveraged the power of Linux and the years of innovation in Linux with some customizations we built in house to really tune it for IoT scenarios. And then when we move into user space, we have a series of open source software, uh, libraries, daemons, things you would expect to see in Linux, and some custom services we wrote to provide the core experience that an IoT need device needs and that your application running on an IoT device needs. 
like over the air update, like authentication to the cloud to Azure, um, and connectivity options, connecting to Wi-Fi, that kind of thing. Um, you know, and we leverage a lot of open source here, and so we actually publish all of our changes back uh, to the open source community, and we really want to be able to not only innovate, but for the community to be able to leverage that work that we're doing. And then lastly, we get into applications, which um, and the Azure Sphere OS actually has a couple different forms. We have some applications that we'll talk about that run in a traditional Linux environment and some applications that run in more uh, bare metal kind of classic microcontroller style environments. So Ryan, let me uh, rewind a little. So you're uh, in charge of you know working with the uh, silicon vendors to to quote unquote adapt or or you know integrate the uh, OS with uh, the hardware. So there are various chips out there supporting Azure Sphere. Um, there's the MediaTek, uh, you know, MT3620, which is well known. These include things like built-in networking, security technologies, sometimes multiple CPU cores. Um, and so, how how do we work with the Azure Sphere, um, you know, OS to adapt it to that kind of specific hardware? And and do do developer have to care that at the end of the day that it's a different hardware under the OS from their perspective? Yeah, I think one of the really interesting things that's going on in the IoT space right now is hardware is getting more sophisticated at low price points. You're seeing chips, like you mentioned, like the MediaTek MT3620, that is five CPU cores, uh, three general purpose cores, two very specialized cores. It's a pretty complex little system. And IoT to OSs and operating systems, code, applications, all kind of have to figure out how to work in that environment. Mm -hmm. So in Azure Sphere, we try to hide as much of the underlying hardware specifics as possible while exposing the power. And so let me give some concrete examples here. If you're familiar with ARM CPU architectures, they're generally split into two families. The Cortex-A, which is your application processor. It's what's in your smartphone. It's what's on uh, a lot of higher-end devices. It's close to a desktop CPU in terms of capability. And then you have the Cortex-M family, which are really microcontrollers. They run a real-time OS usually, and they're kind of purpose-built, often in sensor devices. They both specialize and really excel at two very different things. So we want to bring the power of both of those into the operating system so you can write code that targets a high-level operating system like Linux and hooks up to the network and does all the things you need on a more capable CPU. But at the same time, you can also leverage the power of a microcontroller where you need real-time guarantees, where you need predictability and want to run a real-time OS or maybe even bare metal because you're so sensitive to timing operations. So Azure Sphere OS kind of brings those two worlds together and lets you program for the environment that makes sense for your application without necessarily having to understand all of the hardware and all of the cases involved. And so um, it, when we dig into this, a great example is if you think of the kind of smart thermostat that you ha might have at home, you're going to have one part of your code that's drawing UX, drawing an LCD. Um, you're going to have another part of your code that's talking to the furnace and toggling something physical. And those might run on two different CPU cores in Azure Sphere. And that gives you two different programming models. It also gives you two different security models. If you add a bug in your LCD code, you don't ne want it necessarily turning on the gas to your furnace and you know, giving an attacker direct control over that physical part of the device. Mm -hmm. And so Azure Sphere OS really allows for that isolation, those security boundaries, and that mixed mode programming model. Interesting. Well, talking about security, actually, um, is, am I right saying that the Pluton runtime run actually takes care of a lot of that for, for developers? Yeah, yeah. So the Pluton runtime is kind of the foundation of our trusted computing base. It's the first software that runs on the device when you boot the chip up. And Pluton is actually something that is a combination of both hardware. There's Microsoft hardware technology that we have developed over the years to protect uh, a lot of really critical products that we leverage. In addition, there's software, there's firmware running on a dedicated CPU core. Um, you know, that's the only software running on that CPU core, so it's very hard to attack and compromise, and it gets some resistance on things like side channel attacks and the kind of things that you hear about in the industry going on these days. So Pluton 
really is responsible for a few key components of the operating system in terms of security. It basically is the code that authorizes the rest of the OS to boot. So it says this software is valid, it's allowed to execute, um, there's no security issues in the sense of we've revoked software or anything like that. Um, it's also what handles authentication to the cloud. So when you're talking to Azure IoT Hub or, or your other cloud endpoints, you want to make sure you have a strong, secure connection that is a genuine device and that you know that someone is not spoofing a product to get control of someone else's uh, device on the network. And then lastly, the, the thing it handles that I think is maybe a bit counterintuitive if you haven't spent a lot of time in the security industry is power management, things like reboot and CPU frequency. Mm -hmm. So those are actually operations that are really security sensitive. There's a lot of really clever attacks that hackers are doing related to changing voltage very subtly and being able to extract information. And so Pluton guards all of those sensitive operations so that we can say, yes, this is legitimate, or we can veto certain operations to ensure that hackers have a harder time to get at that sensitive uh, data and operations. That's that's interesting. I didn't know that this such attacks actually were happening. That's that's pretty uh, pretty amazing. But it's another sign that actually, uh, you know, the Azure Sphere is super complete and and covers lots of grounds in in basically redefining or defining what what MCU security is about. So it's great. So the next layer in that architecture diagram you had on that slide uh, is the security monitor, if I remember correctly. Um, so what is the role of that security monitor on top of Pluton, and and how does it work in in the uh, in the Azure Sphere OS? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's one of the things that when I get new developers on my team, they have a natural question of, well, we just talked about the, the trusted computing base, Pluton being the security part of the operating system. Why do we have another one? And so we actually wanted to split certain operations into different domains. And that gives us our defense and depth that we talked about. So if you have a compromise and you only compromise one component in the system, you're limited in what you can do. So the security monitor kind of complements Pluton. And so it has a different set of security operations it's responsible for. Um, before I get into the operations, the other thing that's interesting here is Pluton is, a, Pluton is actually a dedicated CPU core, whereas the security monitor actually shares a CPU core with Linux and the uh, rest of the OS. It uses a technology from ARM called TrustZone on the first chip on the market. But the idea is um, you've seen secure enclaves being mentioned in Products like phones, iOS and Android both have one, mm -hmm. for example. We're leveraging that kind of technology to get isolation. So the security monitor is responsible for authorizing access to resources. So it's what says your application can go toggle this GPIO pin, for example, yep. or use the I2C bus or whatever it is. It's also the only thing that can write to Flash. And so if you think about it, your application needs to write to Flash. Maybe you're logging data for example, but you don't necessarily want an application to be able to scribble over the bootloader in the system. Mm -hmm. And so the security monitor gates and says, yes, you're allowed to touch this region of the flash chip, or no, I need to protect access to this other region because it's got something security sensitive uh, or, or critical to the system's operation. Um, and then lastly, it manages memory and resource allocation. And so it carves off blocks of RAM for individual applications and CPU cores. And it isolates that memory so that your code running on the Cortex-M core can't just go access code and RAM that the Linux kernel is using and vice versa. Interesting. So it's basically the, the guardian of the fort, of so the hardware fort, right? Exactly. Cool. Um, so let's um, actually look at the uh, other layer on top. We'll bring, I think, Barry back for this one, the uh, Linux kernel. So that's very interesting here. So Barry, let me ask you this. So what's the, the role of the Linux kernel there and why do we pick Linux? We have, like we are Microsoft, right? We have Windows, we used to have Windows CE, we have uh, tons of solutions there. So why pick a Linux kernel for Azure Sphere? That's a good question. There's two parts to that. Uh, so first is the Linux targets a diverse range of hardware in the embedded microcontroller space. So it has good drivers and good abstractions that we can use to build the rest of our software with. Um, also, customers who are working in RTOSs and microcontrollers uh, value the open source community and uh, the ability to, uh, to leverage the open source world. Um, and we feel very strongly in Azure Sphere that, uh, that we should be part of that process as well. 
So our Linux kernel runs in supervisor mode on the ARM A7 core, and it's carefully tuned for the, the flash and RAM footprint of the Azure Sphere microcontroller. Remember, this is a microcontroller with just four megabytes of RAM for the Linux OS to run in. Um, it provides a surface for preemptible execution of user-space processes, um, and it gives the processes separate address spaces. Um, it's the Linux kernel. It's based on the 4.9 release uh, from linux.org. Um, we take upstream releases and merge them in monthly and push those updates out to our customers monthly as well. Uh, to keep our kernel small, uh, we have a very minimal feature set. Uh, we have no module support, um, so you can't load modules on the fly. Um, that's both for size and to limit the attack surface. Uh, we have no runtime code generation, no JIT is supported. Um, again, that keeps our size small, and it also keeps the attack surface small. If you can't JIT, you know, it's much harder to attack. Uh, and we have none of uh, sort of the surprising number of features of the OS uh, because we just don't need them. Uh, we have no sudo, for example, because no application ever needs to change its ID. Uh, we have a custom LSM that handles process credentials, so we don't have to deal with, with the usual login and password infrastructure. Um, so yeah, our kernel is kept as small as we possibly can. That makes it a small attack footprint as well. It's, a, it's fair to say that we've been basically stripping out, you know, hey, I don't need that, I don't need that, I don't need that. And then looking at what was left and say, hey, I'm gonna really, you know, harden that, make it like super solid and robust and and uh, and secure, right? Yeah, exactly, that's it. And, but, but that means that, well, basically we put a lot of efforts, a lot of development in, in that product. And so customers are gonna be using that. And we're, we're talking about like long time support, like in the industry of IoT, devices are out there for decades, right? And that's something is not especially common. Your laptop is dead after two years, but in the world of IoT, devices are actually put out there. Now it was like uh, some of these MCUs running on battery for a long time and some, you know, and so we need to make sure that we deliver support. How is Microsoft approaching support? both from the perspective of the security and perspective of the OS bits as well. So we are, I guess, you guys are on the hooks for the next, what, 10 years? We are on the hook for more than 10 years. So for the next decade, uh, Microsoft provides, uh, maintains all of the software other than your application that runs on the device, the Linux kernel, the daemons, uh, all of the user space components. Um, so all of those components, the Microsoft components and the high-level application from the customer are all signed by Microsoft. Uh, all of the application updates are delivered through a trusted Microsoft pipeline, and the compatibility of all of those updates is verified before uh, installation. So OS services host the high-level application container, and they're responsible for communicating with the Azure Sphere security service. They manage network authentication, and they manage the network firewall both for outgoing connections and for incoming connections. So the, the idea of the firewall is to protect um, both the application running on the device and protect the rest of the internet uh, from the application itself. So also during development, OS services also communicate with the connected PC and application that's being debugged. Awesome. So these are very, you know, uh, complete features, and uh, we're gonna have another episode, uh, you know, talking about the defense in depth and the developer experience you just uh, alluded to. Um, so both of you, you know, uh, Barry, Ryan, thanks a lot for joining us on the IT show today and and uh, sharing your the insights about Azure Sphere OS uh, for you. The audience, I hope you enjoyed that IoT show episode. If you want to learn more and get started with Azure Sphere, you can go to the aka.ms slash IoT show slash Azure Sphere link, and you're going to get to that getting started page. Thanks, Barry, and thanks, Ryan, as well, for this insight into the Azure Sphere OS. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. And if you want to learn more about Azure Sphere and get started with it, you can go to aka.ms slash IoT show slash Azure Sphere. And do not forget to subscribe for the next episode of the art show. Bye.